Okay, uh, feel free to continue that conversation uh, after as we uh, head out for coffee and tea and uh, uh, get to know uh, some of those that you've started that conversation with. I don't know if you've noticed, but opposition to the Christian faith has been growing all around the world. In some countries, uh, they've actually instituted anti-conversion laws, which in Australia are growing. Uh, the penalty uh, at the moment is $10,000 or 10 years in jail or being sent to re-education. The Victorian laws actually focus particularly on the Christian church, anyone involved in prayer, counselling or deliverance ministries. The Queensland laws are focused on health professionals. The ACT is narrower and Tasmania is going to exceed all of those uh, penalties and restrictions. Neil uh, Foster, the Associate Professor of Law in Newcastle, said the Victorian law is incredibly extensive with the power to investigate peoples and organisations, primarily churches. Anyone can put in a complaint. It doesn't actually have to be the person. It can be a third party. Uh, some have said it's world leading. Others have said it's the biggest attack ever on religious freedom in years. It criminalises conversations between children and parents. It interferes with sound professional medical advice and it silences ministers of religion. I don't know about you, but when you put your hand up to start this journey of following Jesus, did you ever think that you would arouse the opposition and hostility of the culture in which you live. Over the last five weeks, we've been investigating what it is to do the journey with Jesus, this new normal, this following on the way. I want to say that uh, following Jesus will bring you into spiritual conflict with the culture in which you live. Jesus told us to pray, lead us not into temptation, deliver us from the evil one. Jesus knew that if you were to follow him and his kingdom, you would be following into a conflict with the evil one that would bring you into power encounters uh, that far exceed the very materialistic and secular view of this world. But Jesus says that when... You walk with me, I'll bring you sight, I'll bring you light, and I'll bring you the might to live differently. So over the last five weeks, we've been on this journey where everyone gets to play, where you get to expect the unexpected, where you are involved in confronting spiritual strongholds. Last week, we looked at Mission Possible, and today I want to finish this series by looking at three battle stories of the church engaging the enemy. You and I are called to be part of the way. There are two words to describe us in the beginnings of the early church. We're called the way or the gathering. We're called the church or the journey. Uh, a number of times, eight times, we're referred to in this way. About that time there arose a great disturbance about the way. And I'd like us uh, just for a few moments to start this journey of exploring what will happen if you're really serious about Jesus, if you're wanting to follow him completely in a culture that's in, uh, increasingly darker. If you've got a Bible, we're going to look at uh, the last of those three stories. In uh, Acts 19, we're going to flick over to that. If you've got a Bible or a phone or an iPad, uh, just feel free to join with me. Acts 19 and 11, it's, Paul is in Ephesus. It is one of the biggest uh, centers of spiritual power and darkness in the ancient world. The third or fourth largest city in the Roman Empire. And it's here we read, as uh, you've heard this morning, a healing story. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even his sweatbands, his handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick 
and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews uh, went around driving out evil spirits, tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief, uh, chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? The man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they all ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and the Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held high in honour. And many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. A number who had practised sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. And when they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachma. And in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Lord God, we commit our time to you. We thank you that you are our Father in heaven and we've come here to honour you as a gathered people this morning. Lord, we thank you that your kingdom is coming and it's breaking into the kingdom of this world and that the gates of Hades are falling and that the kingdom of life and of God is growing and and will one day be the whole universe, the kingdom of our God and of our Christ will reign and rule. And so, Lord, would your will be done right now in our hearts in this place as we come in your name. Amen. Peter in Acts 10 says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power And he went around doing good and healing all who are under the harsh control, the power of the devil, because God was with him. You know, when we read the story of Jesus, there are bits we really like and understand, that he went around preaching salvation. I get that bit. But he went around praying for the sick and people were healed. That's incredibly encouraging. But he also went around pushing out spirits or demons or demonic powers preaching praying and pushing that was the sort of person that Jesus was because he saw that it was possible to come under the harsh control to be manipulated personally by evil and so Jesus said to the apostle Paul in Acts 26 17 and 18 Jesus said I'm sending you to them to do three things to open their eyes They need sight. To turn them from darkness to light. They need light. And from the power and jurisdiction and authority and control of Satan to God. They need might to live differently. So that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance amongst those who are being useful, made sanctified, set apart by faith in me. Jesus said, I want to change people's ability to live. Satan delights in chaos and confusion and control. Jesus says, I want to bring clarity, conviction, confidence to live in this world. And so let's look at those three things. If he wants us to be involved in helping people have sight, open eyes, to turn and to change from Satan's control to the power of God. What's involved? Here's the first thing. I think we need to be prepared to engage the enemy with clarity. The first story of this engagement is found in Acts 13 and verse 9. Paul, being led by the Holy Spirit, is led straight into enemy territory. He's not only led into enemy territory, he's led into one of the most... uh, a darkest spiritual stronghold in the ancient world on the island of Cyprus. And it's here he's going to meet a man who's interested in God, Sergius Paulus, a a Roman proconsul. But he's also introduced to a 
a uh, magician, a sorcerer, a false prophet, whose name was Bar-Jesus, the son of Jesus. He looked like a person of light. His name was Elymas, or Wisdom. And yet this man was standing between God and this man who was seeking God. It was very common in the ancient world to have sorcerers and fortune tellers to accompany people of power. Just ask Ronald Reagan about his fortune teller. Uh, people all around the world, even today, often resort to darkness for some international decisions that they made. But here we're in Paphos on the island of Cyprus. It is the birthplace of Venus or Aphrodite. People were coming from all over the world to this very spot that Paul is now encountering a false prophet and a seeker. It's an incredibly powerful place of immorality and spiritual darkness that was common in the ancient world. If you want to know who was uh, residing there, her name was Aphrodite or Venus. You can meet her in the British Museum. Uh, there's a couple of her hanging around in one of the corridors I bumped into. She was the goddess of sexual love and life, the powers of life, of victory, of fertility, of prostitution. She was about the goddess of everything. Uh, one guy said that uh, this city was infamous. Athanasius said it was a religion that uh, deified lust. It was a place that de uh, defiled men and depraved them and de uh, uh, in character. And it's here that Paul does two things. He closes the eyes of the false prophet and opens the eyes of Sergius Paulus. Notice these very harsh words. Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked. He looks straight at Elymas and says five things. You're not Bar Jesus. You're not a son of Jesus. You're a son of the devil. You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord. Now the hand of the Lord is against you and you're going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. God gave Alamus a physical blindness that matched his own spiritual blindness. Paul will write later that the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. You see, the devil's main tool is actually to close your mind down. It's to close your eyes to the glory and truth that is Jesus. That's his main strategy, is to turn you off, to close you down, to close your eyes. And when people come to faith, their eyes of their heart are opened. Suddenly, truth and light become relevant. These are some of the, uh, one writer said, the most severest of words in the Bible. They're reserved for those who stand between men and truth, between those who stand between men and God. It must be the heart that loves Sergius Paulus who speaks in anger to this sorcerer. So, what happened? Well, Sergius Paulus, the proconsul who had this sidekick called Alamus, he was an intelligent man. He had sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of the Lord. He wanted to know truth. Immediately this mist and darkness came over Alamus and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw, when he saw what was happening, he believed. For he was amazed at the teaching of the Lord. One man's eyes were closed, another man's eyes were opened. You see, we're called to be in the business of opening eyes. We're involved in a spiritual conflict where the people around you are walking in darkness. And it's when the light of God, when it's the, the sight of God is given to a person, they begin to, begin to see 
So what happened to Lucius Sergius Paulus? In the ancient world, you've got three names if you're a good Roman. The first name is your, is your personal name. The second name is your clan name. And the third name is your small family name. We do know uh, from at least five inscriptions who this man was. He was part of uh, the project managers on the Tiber. They've got inscriptions of him there. He was involved in government in Turkey. And now they have records of him being at this time on the island of Cyprus. So William Ramsey said the inscriptions that they've found confirm that he was a Christian and that his entire family became Christians. You see, uh, the first thing that happens if you're going to follow Jesus is you will need to engage the enemy with sight, with clarity, to be able to see and spiritually discern what's happening. Why are these hearts closed to God? Only God can open hearts. Only God can open eyes. It's not an intellectual thing. It's a spiritual thing. And Paul was involved in engaging the enemy with clarity. But we're also called not only to open eyes, but to turn people from darkness to defeat dark angels. Going to a place of prayer in Acts 16, uh, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. That's actually not in the Bible. What's in the Bible are these words. She had the spirit of... Of Python. Now that makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? In the ancient world, everybody knew what that meant. We need it to be translated in our Bibles to make sense of it. You and I live in, on the internet, but you know what? There's three internets. There's the internet, there's the deep net, and then there's the dark net. Do you know that? And there's more activity happening in the dark net that's happening in the internet. It's unseen, uncontrolled, and darkness is swirling around our planet with all of the technology that was created for good. There is a swirling darkness that is engulfing the planet. And in the ancient world, there was a spirit of Python. Uh, it's probably worth uh, just trying to make sense of that. In the ancient world, we knew where the snake lived. He lived in Greece on a mountain. He was the snake that could tell you the future. He was a, a snake of divination. It was the spiritual center of the world. It's called Delphi. It's in the mountains just over the gulf from Corinth. If you start on that left-hand side, if you were in the ancient world, you'd make your way up all the pathways past all the treasure houses. And if you put more money in there, you went up the, the queue... If you put in a little bit, you went back down the queue, but eventually you found your way up to the temple where Apollo had killed the serpent. And now he was Pythian Apollo. He had the power. He was the god of light who could tell you your future, who could divine everything that was going to happen. And so people from all over the world came to this spiritual center of the world to find out what was going to happen to them. Today, you can actually walk up that same path. And uh, in Delphi, you can start at the bottom and work your way up the side of this mountain, past the temple, past the theatre, right up to the very top where there is a sporting facility. You see sport and religion go hand in hand. Have you ever noticed that? Is sport a religion in Australia? It is when we win not so much when we lose. But you see, the worship of gods, the worship of sport went hand in hand. And here in this temple, Apollo had killed the, the python. Now he was the python. And he gave that power to a priestess who would sit on a stool and people would line up. This girl would, uh, on the seventh day of every month, have a bath. They would sacrifice a goat to Apollo she would enter the cave underneath this temple. She would sit on a tripod and people would pay incredible wealth to ask their one question. What's going to happen 
Kings would come. Should I attack this nation? Would I win the battle? And she would give a response. Often she would rave and then someone would translate for them. It was an interesting place. She had the spirit of the python. And so this spirit of python was following Paul all around the city of Philippi, shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved or a way of salvation. Is there any difference? Would you like the endorsement of a demon for your sermon, sponsored by Python? Uh, Paul just put up with it as he was going around sharing and this girl was raving in the background. She was an oracle and people knew that she spoke for the gods. Would you take a demonic endorsement on your sermon? She literally was saying, here is another way, here is a way to be saved. You can have Jesus or Jesus plus Apollo or Jesus plus Apollo and Zeus. In fact, you can, you can mix and match. Somehow Paul got to the point, he finally became so annoyed He turned around and said to the spirit, notice they didn't say to the girl, he actually spoke to the spirit. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that very moment, the spirit left her. If you read all of the Gospels, you'll see that about 40% of Jesus' ministry was dealing with the darkness, dealing with the demonic or spirits. In the name of Jesus Christ, that is our authority. I command you, come out of her. And at that moment, she was released from the spirit of the snake. Shouldn't surprise us that in Revelation 12 and 20, we read of this ancient snake, this ancient serpent, Satan, the devil, who leads the whole world astray. You and I, if we're following Jesus, are going to find ourselves in spiritual conflict with darkness. Earlier in Acts 5 and 16, those who were tormented by evil, impure spirits were healed. Acts 8 and 7, for with shrieks or mega shouts, impure spirits came out of many and they found healing. Dr. Luke is very particular in distinguishing between sickness and spiritual oppression and spiritual control. If there was a continuum of of what Satan likes to do, the prayer of Jesus says that he likes to lead you into temptation. And our prayer is, Lord, we don't want to be tempted. We want to be tested, but not tempted. But sometimes it goes a little bit further in that you yield to temptation. And then if you make a pattern of giving in to that which you know is wrong, it becomes a compulsion, an addiction. It becomes a slavery. And that if uh, you keep going down that pathway, you find the Bible says your conscience is seared so that it becomes a pathology. And if that pathology is not dealt with, then you may find yourself having a squatter come and empower that addiction. And that stronghold then becomes a controlling part of a person's life with a complete inability to resist or to deal with it. This girl was so consumed with the spirit of the python that only the very authority of Jesus could break the control and bring freedom. You and I are called to engage the enemy, to defeat dark angels, and to act with his authority. To take us from the power and jurisdiction of Satan to the jurisdiction of God. In the world in which uh, the New Testament was written, they believed that the whole world was influenced every aspect by spiritual powers. And the only way the ancient world knew how to deal with that was through ritual or spells or magical recipes or in incantations that often have prayers of protection uh, in jewellery put around their neck. 
They would carry them on their body, place them in their homes as a way of somehow trying to control the power of evil. And probably one of the strongest places also in the ancient world was Ephesus. Here, nearly every superstitious and satanic act was practiced. Books containing formulas for sorcery, for ungodly and forbidden arts were so plentiful in the city. So Paul has gone to Cyprus where Venus and Aphrodite came out of the water. He's gone up to Greece and he's engaged the spirit of Python, Apollo the Python. He's dealt with him. And now he's over in Turkey, in Ephesus. And here is one of the seventh great wonders of the ancient world. It's the temple of uh, Artemis. And what we have left is one column. That's it. One of the seventh, seven wonders of the ancient world. A place of incredible spiritual power third or fourth largest city of the Roman Empire, home to every sorcerer, charlatan of all sorts, says Metzger. And here Paul did no ordinary miracles. I don't know about you, but Paul did extraordinary. It's actually no ordinary miracles. I I think any miracle is amazing. I get excited when I hear a healing story. Do you? I think it's amazing. God is an amazing God. But Paul was doing not ordinary ones, he was doing extraordinary miracles. So that even his tools of trade, when he was sweating it out in the tent-making industry, people were nicking his sweatbands and his, you know, it's kind of like tennis when they take off the sweatbands and throw them and people fall over the edge to try and grab them. People were taking his aprons, his, his gloves, his, and they were taking them to people that were unwell and God was bringing healing. You know, when God is working around the world, there are things that we can't even talk about in a first world because we find them just too incredible. But they're happening all around the world when God does extraordinary things. So that even these things that touch them, to those that were ill, their illnesses were cured and evil spirits left them. So in our reading, uh, some Jews thought, well, if there's power on offer, and uh, if we can add that to our portfolio of, of everything we can offer, let's use the magic of Jesus to see people released and freed. So some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to manipulate or invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demonized. They would say in the name of uh, Jesus whom Paul preaches, uh, I'm going to use a second-hand relationship to try and get some spiritual authority. In uh, this Jesus that Paul preaches, I command you to come out. These seven sons, one day the evil spirit answered them. Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who on earth are you? You see, uh, the... The only thing that has spiritual traction in the spiritual realm is a first-hand relationship with Jesus. Not a second-hand, but a first-hand relationship with Jesus. He invites you and I to know him, to receive him, to live in his authority. Jesus said, I give you authority over all the snakes and scorpions. I give you authority over everything and nothing can harm you. So Paul has spoken to a spirit and now a spirit has spoken back. I don't know about you, have you ever had that experience? Where you've prayed for someone and someone else answers the prayer in the person you're praying for and says, you can't have him, he belongs to us. You know that this is not just a physical thing, it's not a mental thing, it's actually a spiritual encounter. And so here we have... Spirits actually engaging people. Can you converse with demons? Um, Think about it for a moment. When you and I are involved in this spiritual conflict, there is a truth encounter where God wants to open eyes. There is a repentance encounter where we need to turn from things 
to the kingdom of God. And there is a power encounter where the, only the authority of Jesus can make a, a difference, where to act with his authority. Dr. Luke, uh, in uh, the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 8, has this story that's repeated in all three Gospels. Jesus uh, meets a man in a graveyard who is at the end of the continuum. He's end, at the end of the spectrum of everything that you and I would say is definitely demonic. And he comes before Jesus and says, what do you want with me or us, says Matthew's Gospel. Jesus, Son of the Most High, I beg you, don't torture us. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man, but it hadn't. I'm glad that's in the story, that it's a process. Jesus asked, what's your name? Legion. Because many demons had gone into him. And they, and they the demons, begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss, the final punishment. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs. And in that conversation, Jesus gives them permission. You see, uh, there are people in our congregation that in their professional life have prayed with people. And as a result of doing that, be it medically or psychologically or, or in pastoral ministry, other entities have answered and become involved in the person being released. So after we've got seven naked Jewish exorcists running down the road, everybody in the town heard about it. And people started to believe. Because in the ancient world, who ran the show was the darkness. And suddenly now the light was bringing freedom and release to the captive. And people started to hold the name of Jesus highly. And many of those who believe now, notice who we're talking about, many of those who believed and openly confessed what they had done, a number of those who practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of all of these magical scrolls and fetishes and curses and blessings that had been empowered by the demonic, when they calculated the value from the Christian congregation, it came to 50,000 drachma. Anybody got any drachma on them this morning? So I, I did a current, uh, currency converter this morning, and it's 20 million Australian dollars. Just in black magic that was in the church. You see, when the church actually cleans its act up, look what happens. In this way, the word of the Lord, what? Spread widely and grew in power. Wouldn't you love to belong to a, a church where the word of God was empowered in the culture in which they lived? But it happens when the church actually realizes that to be used by God, if I want to be set apart and sanctified by faith to be useful in the kingdom of God, I need God to root out the darkness and the secrets. In the ancient world, the power of the magic was in the secret. If you told someone about the secret that you were wearing, you had no power. But now people are openly declaring the secrets that they've been carrying for so long and God suddenly brought freedom. He brought power. He brought a change. You know, when Julius Caesar invaded Britain at Dover, if you go to the castle at Dover, the first layer was Roman, and then you go through Norman, and then you go through all of the people that had occupied that castle. But the Romans, when Julius Caesar got everybody at the cliff of Dover, he said, I want you to look back on the shore because he put all of the boats to the torch. And they realize we're not going back. We've burned our boats. We're going forward. And Rome invaded Britain. There was nothing left to do but to advance. Let me ask you this question. 
Can you remember a time when you severed all contact with cults, occults, with things that God would say have no place in the life of a believer? There were people in the church of Ephesus that had $20 million of black magic in their back pocket. And God dealt with that and the church became a powerful witness to the kingdom of God. You need to commit to getting rid of objects that are associated with the occult and false religion. You can't hang on to them and be free. So think about it. Jesus invites us into this new normal of engaging the enemy with clarity, to open eyes, to defeat dark angel, to see people turn from darkness, to act with his authority, to see people go from one territory to another. Michael Green in his book, Evangelizing the Early Church, said Christians went out into the world as exercisers, healers, as well as preachers. Ramsey McMullen, the Yale historian, said it was this manhandling of demons that served a purpose quite essential to the Christian definition of monotheism. It made physically, dramatically visible the superiority of the Christian's patron power over all others. It was a head-on confrontation with supernatural beings to God. He invites us in our journey, this new normal, of being a follower of Jesus to be aware of the evil, to be aware that we not only live in an internet but a dark net, that you and I live not only in a material world but a spiritual world, and we need spiritual weapons to deal with spiritual issues. I'm sending you to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power and jurisdiction of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance amongst those who are sanctified by faith in me. God has a future for you. He has an inheritance for you. He has authority for you. You don't need to be frightened of anything that I've said this morning because you know that someone, someone who is bigger is in the room. Someone who is greater than the God of this world. Someone who opens eyes, not closes eyes. When the devil brings up your past, remind him of his future. When the ad adversary is ready to strike, remember that God is there to strengthen. Don't him allow Satan to remind you of what God has already forgotten. Jesus brings sight light and might. You know, as I finish uh, in the Alpha program, uh, Nicky Gumbel tells the story of a young lawyer who came to Alpha as an atheist with the sole purpose of disrupting every night the small group met. And there was another girl at his table called Sarah. She was an unbeliever who the big issue for her was the power of evil. She didn't believe in it. So that night when they talked about how can I resist evil, David towards the end of the night became incredibly angry and for no apparent reason, as if taken over by a demonic power, he physically threatened one of the host leaders. Sarah's eyes were opened that what was happening was not just a conversation that had escalated, but here was a spiritual authority that was being revealed and the gentle response that brought change and transformation changed Sarah. God's power is much greater than the power of enemy. Jesus brings clarity, confidence and courage. He is a truth encounter. He is a repentance encounter. He is a power encounter. Will you bow with me in prayer? If you're really serious about following Jesus, then opposition is part of the deal. You and I will be in spiritual conflict with our culture if we're serious about the Christian journey. We'll be walking in enemy territory where only his authority can make the difference. Jesus, we want to thank you for opening our eyes to the truth of your word. 
And so we invite your light and your love to come and continue to lead us. Would you help us to understand and learn how to wield spiritual weapons you give us so that we might both protect those that we love and help rescue others who are blindly following the deceiver of men? Would you empower us in rescuing others from the power of the enemy and transferring them into the kingdom of our God and his Christ? And it's in your powerful name we pray and we work. Amen. Amen. And just one more thing. If you'd like someone to pray for you at the end of the service, um, Jeff, you'll be around. Myself, we have some of our other leaders who I'm sure would love to come and to pray.